Welcome to the Open Door Sunday School class. We are so glad that you've joined us today. I'm Katherine Bunce, and today we're going to be studying Psalm 42, which is called Yearning for God in the Midst of Distress. Well, the sons of Korah were a group of priests who were charged with the ministry of singing and psalms or poems that are to be sung. And Jesus told us that they were inspired by God. They intend to shape the mind, how the mind thinks, and they intend to shape how the heart feels. When we immerse ourselves in the Psalms, <clears throat> we are thinking and feeling with God. The Psalm that instruct are called the Miskel. Blessed is the man who delights in the instruction of the Lord and on his instruction, he meditates day and night. So the Psalms were written to awaken, express, and shape the emotional life of God's people. Poetry and singing exist because God made us with emotions and not just thoughts. Our emotions are massively important. Would you join me in prayer? Father, thank you for your Psalms. Let them awaken our emotional life and let us meditate on them so you can open us up to your thinking and your feelings. Lord, help us to see our walk through life through your eyes. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, not only is the Psalm a song to sing, but Psalm 42 is a lament song, and that is expressing an individual's agony of soul, and the soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions, and your body. Here you ever, uh, have you ever had a time when you were going through discouragement, or maybe your walk with God had become dry and plain, or you were simply going through the motions, but life had lost its meaning. Have you ever been there? More importantly, are you there now? Well, the writer of this psalm is in a dark place. Many of us know what that is like. And I'm going to read Psalm 42. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so my soul longs for you, O oh God. Well, the Hebrew word soul here doesn't mean your spirit, but a person's life, who and what he is. Think of it as a combination, again, as our mind, our will, and our emotions. Verse two, my soul thirsts for God for the living God. When shall I come and behold the face of God? My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me continually, where is your God? <clears throat> These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I went with the multitude and led them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of thanksgiving, a multitude keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O oh my soul? And why are you disquieted? Why are you worried or distressed within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my help and my God. My soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember from the land of Jordan and of Hermon and from Mount Mitzgar. Deep calls to deep at the thunder of your waterfalls. All your waves and your billows have gone over me. By day, the Lord commands his steadfast love and at night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I 
I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I walk mournfully because the enemy oppresses me? As with a deadly wound in my body, my adversaries taunt me while they say to me continually, where is your God? Why are you cast down, O oh my soul? And why are you disquieted? Why are you worried or distressed within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my help and my God. Externally, his circumstances are oppressing. Verse 3 says that his enemy says to me all day long, where is your God? And verse 10 says the same thing, only it describes the effect as a deadly wound. As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me while they say to me all day long, where is your God? And the taunt, where is your God, implies that something else has gone wrong too, or they wouldn't be saying that. It seems to them like he has been abandoned. Verse eight says, by day, the Lord commands his uh, steadfast love, and at night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. Well, this is not a song of jubilant hope. He doesn't feel jubilant hope, but he is seeking jubilant hope. This is a prayer song and a pleading song. A song to the God of my life, he says. That is, a song pleading for his life. But isn't it amazing that he is singing his prayer? My guess is this is where Psalms 42 came from anyway. This very psalm may very well have been a nighttime prayer song. Verse 9 says, I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of my enemy? The word forgotten is an overstatement, and he knows it. What he means is that it looks like God has forgotten him. It feels as if God has forgotten him. In the midst of the tumult of emotions that we have, we're not always careful with our words, and a lot of the times we overstate our reality. We have no guarantee that we will never feel abandoned by God, but we do have a promise that God will be with us, and we have the assurance that nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is in Acts 8. Our feelings may not always reverberate with this truth, but we thank God that our fickle feelings do not alter the truth. Why art thou cast down, O oh, my soul, he asked. His soul has been depressing him, crushing him. So he stands up and says, Self, listen for a moment. I will speak to you. On this side of the cross, now remember, Psalm 40, uh, 52 was written before Jesus was on earth. And this is 42 and not 52, excuse me. We know the greatest ground for our hope, Jesus Christ, crucified for our sins and triumphant over death. So the main thing that we must learn to is preach the gospel to ourselves. Listen, self, if God is for me, who can be against me? He who does not spare his own son, but gave him up for me, how will he not also along with him graciously give me all things. 
Who shall bring any charge against me as God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, he was raised. He is uh, who is at the right hand of God and indeed is interceding for me. Who shall separate me from the love of Christ? And that is Romans 8, of course. Learn to preach the gospel to yourself. If this psalmist were living after Christ, that is what he would have done. His external circumstances are oppressing. His internal emotional condition is depressed and full of turmoil, but he is fighting for hope. And re the really remarkable thing is at the end of the Psalm, he is still fighting, but not yet where he wants to be. The last word of the Psalm says, where, why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. He leaves us still fighting for the joyful experience of hope and the freedom from turmoil. Is it a happy ending? Like almost everything else in life, it's mixed. His faith really is amazing and his fight is valiant, but he is not where he wants to be in hope and peace and praise. Many years ago, I was where this psalmist was. I was teaching science in a junior high school, and one morning as I was going to school, I found myself in that very dark place. Have you ever been there? I was overwhelmed with life, and that is not where God wanted me to be. So like this psalmist, I started praising God. I remember looking out my window and seeing a telephone pole, and I thanked God for that telephone pole. I thanked God for the seed that was planted, the tree that grew, the men that took care of shaping that, uh, that telephone pole into the way that it was and all the lines that were going, so it was very active. I praised God for that because it was by God's design that that pole was there. I did not feel like praising, I promise you. Oh, no. <clears throat> I wanted to put my head down on that steering wheel, and I wanted to cry. I then saw a house, and again, I said, God, I praise you for that house. I praise you for the people that live in that house. I praise you for the workers that built the shingles, that did the shingles on the roof. I praise you, God, for all of that. And all the way to school, I praise even to weeds on the side of the road. Father, I praise you because of those beautiful blooms and the butterflies that come in and, and take care of all the needs of that, that plant. And so I praised and I praised and I praised. Well, by the time that I got to school and I put my foot on that parking lot, I was so full of the glory that I near, of, of God that I nearly floated into the building. Why did that change the situation? Well, God is in the praises of his people. Remember, the psalmist preached to his own soul. Verse 5 said, Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil? Why is there turmoil within you? Hope in God. For I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Oh, how crucial this is in the fight of faith. We must learn to preach the truth to ourselves. God knew it was a dark place for me, but he gave me a choice. I could stay in the gloom or I could call out to him and oh, the blessings that were awaiting for me when I cho chose to praise rather than going along with the circumstances.
Did the circumstances change? Absolutely not, but I did. And with God's blessing, I was able to meet my students with love and joy. Verse 11 says, why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him and my salvation and my God. The psalmist is not surrendering to the emotions of discouragement. He is fighting back. He leaves us still fighting for the joyful experience of hope and freedom from turmoil. In the eight, uh, I was going to say in the 1800s, but that's later on, so just hang on to that thought just a minute. C.S. Lewis was the author of the Chronicles of Narnia. You've read those, I'm sure. And he struggled to connect with God during his difficult days after losing his wife to cancer. And he was trying to focus his heart and his mind on God, just as many of us do. In his book, A Grief Observed, he said of his suffering, God has not been trying an experiment on my faith or love in order to find out their qualities. He knew it already. It was I who didn't. In this trial, in the courtroom, he makes us occupy the prisoner's seat, the witness stand, and the judge's bench all at the same time. He always knew that my temple, now this is C.S. Lewis, he always knew that my temple was a house of cards. His only way of making me realize the fact was to knock them down. And when it seemed to him that God wasn't responding. The verse in the Bible says, knock and it shall be opened. His question was, but does knocking mean hammering and kicking the door like a maniac? So I'm guessing this Psalm is in the Bible by God's design. And that if we listen carefully, if we watch this Psalmist struggle, if we meditate on this instruction day and night, our thoughts about God and life on the one hand and our emotions on the other hand will be shaped by God. So if ever you had a time when you were going through discouragement, your walk with God had become dry and plain or you were simply going through the motions and life had lost its meaning, well, when we take those final steps at the end of our human journey and find ourselves standing before God, instead of asking him why our minds, our hearts, and our soul will grasp it at last and we will say to him, I understand. Now let's talk about 1800. There was an, an artist that lived in the 1800s and painted there and his name was G.F. Watt. And he has a famous painting that is entitled Hope. It pictures a poor woman and she is sitting on the top of the world and she is huddled over a harp that is in her arms. Her eyes are bandaged and so that she can't see anything ahead. But she is huddled around this harp and then you notice that all the strings are broken except for one and she's leaning down so far so that she can hear that one string. Well, the broken strings represent her shattered expectations and also her bitter disappointments in life. The one last unbroken string is a string of hope. She strikes that string and a glorious melody floats out over the world and it fills her dark skies with stars. 
the artist painted a great truth. Even when all else is gone, you still have hope. Perhaps the psalmist put it best in verse 5 when he said, Put your hope in God. Let us pray. God, at this moment, it seems like your waves and your billows are going over us when we look around and see the uncertainty that's taking place in our world. And as a deer pants for flowing streams, so our soul longs for you, O oh God. We need to sing unto you with our soul, knowing that you have never, ever forsaken us, nor will you now. We need your covering day and night. Teach us to preach the gospel to ourselves, Father. The drops of blood that you left on the cross at Calvary remind us that we have always been in your thoughts. When we call out to you, you are there. We want to hope in you, God, for we want to praise you our help and our God. Praise you, Father, for your enduring love and your joyous hope. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen.